This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Chrissy Wright, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today. If you want to talk about your life and your money, this is your place. You can get in if you dial at this moment. The number is 888. 888- 825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. We launched the pre-sale on Christie's brand new book, Take Back Your Time, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance. And the book is selling like crazy in pre-sale. Actually, we will be delivering them to your home in September and uh, at the actual launch date. But if you buy as a pre-order, you get uh, all kinds of goodies, $50 worth of stuff, including the ebook, including the audio book as read by the author. It's all there. Take back your time. The guilt-free guide to Life Balance by Christy Wright. You can get that at RamseySolutions.com. And Christy, tonight we have a big event. Yeah, this is exciting because we have been building up to this in celebration of the launch of the new book and, and getting ready for it to be here on September 14th. But tonight we are doing a free digital event on Facebook and YouTube, and you can register at RamseySolutions.com slash balance. And I'm going to be walking you through the four root causes of why we feel out of balance. Because what I've noticed is this topic of balance, we have a lot of feelings about it. Different people have different definitions. We don't really know what it is. We're just sure we don't have it. And so I'm going to help people understand what it is and what it isn't. And then what keeps us from feeling that sense of balance we've been looking for. And we're going to talk about those four root causes because when you know what's keeping you from it, you can know what to do about it. So that's going to be 7 o'clock tonight. And I'm going to be doing a Q&A afterwards. So if people want to tune in live, they can ask their question, and I'll, I'll walk them through it. Very cool. Good stuff. So 7 p.m. Central Time tonight, free on YouTube or on Facebook. And if you want to pre-register for that, I'm an RSVP. We'll send you a link out. Make sure it's easy for you to connect up, and you'll be able to watch this talk tonight. As Christy walks you through this whole idea of uh, balance and, you know, the enemies of it, where it's coming from, where it's going to, all, all those sorts of things. So RamseySolutions.com slash balance. You know, what's interesting is is that I we've talked about this so much that, that I, I, it feels like I'm, I've overdone it, but um, that maybe balance isn't the problem, mm. and, and what you said a minute ago, mm-hmm. that... that um, it may may just be that there's too much. I mean, I'm not sure you're balancing the food on your plate if you have too much food on your plate. Yeah. Yeah. That's not a balance problem. The plate's fine. It didn't tip over. Right. But it's just got too much on it. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because I think we, we throw around this term and we say work-life balance and life balance and all of that. But what's interesting is we can do all the things we think we're supposed to do to have balance, where we manage our calendar and we're super productive and we you know have time off and take vacations, all those things. But we can still feel as if something's missing. We can still feel like we're doing all the things right and something still feels off. And that's because I think that what we're asking when we're asking about balance is really something different than what we want. I think what we really want is to be confident in how we spend our time, be proud of how we spend our time, be confident in our choices when we say yes to this thing or no to that thing versus feeling guilty and questioning, you know, am I doing the wrong thing? I think we want peace in a chaotic world. And so, and I think we want to be in, be happy and enjoy our life. And so what if we talked about balance differently and said, okay, it's not this balancing act, which feels stressful and you can do all that and still not feel like things are right. And what if instead it looks more like peace and the chaos and and being confident in your choices and that's the type of balance that that we want it's more about being a balanced person in an out of balance world versus just perfectly walking the tightrope which is not realistic or fun in my opinion yeah you may you may want to talk about this subject as well as anything else jump in the phone numbers are 888-825-5225 that's 888 i like what marcus buckingham our friend said about that um it's as if 
if you ever do get everything just right, everybody freeze. Yeah, don't move. Because as soon as you flinch one direction or the other, all of a sudden that, quote, balance, unquote, is gone. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you do lose yourself in that process. And, and there's a, the, I, th- I think that there's been a little bit of a guilt tripping, to say the least, uh, in, in the culture about this idea that, okay, you're not nurturing enough. Okay, or you're not productive enough. Uh, you're not working enough. Um, you're not enough. Right. And then we, we threw that in the bucket of out of balance. Yeah, and what's interesting is when we put the pressure on ourselves to balance everything, whether you use the analogy of juggling all the balls, spinning the plates, walking the tightrope, whatever, 50-50 split, this perfect pie that's equally divided, whatever you use as your metric of success for balance that looks like that, you're setting yourself up to fail. But then what's really dangerous, Dave, and I see this all the time in women I work with and men too, for that matter, is it because when you can't do that, because you can't and you won't, it's not realistic or sustainable in any way. Then what happens is it spins up this narrative in your mind that you're failing at everything. You're failing at your job. You're failing your family. You're just failing. Yeah. And that's not true. If I've not got everything in balance with my family, then I'm a bad mom, a bad dad. Mm -hmm. If I don't have everything in balance with my work, uh, then I'm a bad leader. Yes. A a bad, a bad employee. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So you, it's almost like the identity shifts off of this one subject. Yeah, and, and it, it drastically affects how you experience your own life. There are people walking around every day. There's people listening right now that feel like they're failing, and they're not. Maybe they can be more intentional with how they manage their calendar. Maybe they can be more intentional with putting their phone away, but they're not failing. And so I want to get to, that's why I love the tagline of this book, The Guilt-Free Guide to Life Balance, because I think the undercurrent of the issue is this guilt that haunts us. And what I want people to understand is, yes, I'll help you manage your calendar. Yes, I'll help you, you know, use best practices to be productive and do the right things at the right time. But it's not really about the calendar. Mm -hmm. It's about enjoying the life that the calendar represents. Mm Mm-hmm. And feeling balanced and, and peace in your life. And you're remembering you're in control of the calendar. The calendar's not in control of you. Yes. Yeah, you put it on there. Yeah. So you can take it off. That's right. Uh, you can not put it on there. Mm-hmm. That, that's a really good one there. And, and I think there's a, a certain amount of hyperbole, a certain amount of drama has been added to the whole subject. Uh, we were with some friends the other night, and uh, he's opening a business. Mm-hmm. And so he's spent a lot of time sure. opening a business. It always is when you're doing that. And uh, his wife said, well, he's just a workaholic. And we're fairly good friends. And so I said, <laughs> I'm I said, so curious I, I what said, she said. <laughs> I'm calling BS. He's not a workaholic. A workaholic is someone who's addicted to their work and gets all of their juice from work. That is not him. He's paying a price right now to get a business open. He's in a season. That is not workaholism. Quit giving it names it's not. So you can throw around the fact that maybe he didn't make the bed like you wanted him to. Um, so this is what dinner with us sounds like. But, yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but I mean, really, it's just, you know, she th- she completely threw her husband on the bus. Yeah. And he, he's not right. a workaholic. Yeah. There are workaholics, but everybody that works hard is not a workaholic. Right. So we have to quit throwing the hyperbole on this stuff. This is The Ramsey Show. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings.
Christy Wright, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones as we talk about your life and your money here on The Ramsey Show. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. Ron's with us in Washington, D.C. Hey, Ron, how are you? Hey, Dave. I'm a big fan. Listen, since 07, how are you? Well, better than I deserve, sir. How can we help? I've got a quick question, sort of a, a philosophical, spiritual angle to things. Um, I know you guys are big, you know, big into spending and living a legacy. I've got twin girls, 14 years old. I've lost who knows how many jobs over the past, you know, a couple of years. I wasn't even working a year ago. Now I am. Thank, thank the good Lord. I know you're big about saving and, you know, for spending for, you know, and saving for the future. And, but as believers in Christ, obviously we uh, believe in the rapture where our Lord could come back at any time. So say he did come back in the next five minutes, all the money that you save for, you know, is kind of not null and void, but, you know, I'm not saying why is saved because Jesus is going to come back and we, we don't know at any moment. Does this all sort of make sense? Am I just crazy, or am I just, you know, I'm, I'm not saying don't save, but I'm also saying that, you know, say you're Christian members of your family or not, you save your money for them, because obviously once they, and again, I'm going a lot of things here with a Methodist background, you go through the tribulation period, you know, and I've read, you know, Tim LaHaye and Jim Jenkins' books, you know, that... I don't even know. Is, is this all making sense? I yeah. Think I'm <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's kind of two things pulling at this. Um, yes. Number one, it, it's very good. Uh, I think it'll increase the quality of your life while you're here. Okay. And, and the, the quality of your decision-making on money and other things, if you have what you have, which is an eternal perspective. Right. I'm not thinking of uh, 50 years and I'm dirt. Okay. You're thinking okay. beyond that. You're thinking uh, differently than that, otherworldly than that. And that gives you a an advantage because someone who has the broader perspective generally makes better decisions. And gotcha. so that's okay. the beauty of an eternal perspective. Um, then, then if you did within that context, you're, you're kind of got two things pulling at you. Um, one is that once we're dead or raptured, uh, instantaneously money's not important. And anything you've acquired is instantaneously. One second later, none of this matters. Right? Right. So, okay. Wait, 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 wait. So go ahead. The, the, go point, ahead. the point being that the bumper sticker is right. He with the most toys when he dies is dead, which is kind right. of your point, right? And, and then, exactly. uh, then the other side of that is the wisdom with an eternal perspective of living my life in a way that is mature, that is thoughtful thoughtful and wise, uh, that does leave a financial legacy for my family behind, life insurance, a will, savings, paid-for right. assets, those kinds of things, which also line up biblically without being inconsistent with the other thing. So what we're saying is is we don't, we don't rest our eternal hopes on the stuff, but Proverbs does say, in the house of the wise are stores of, this is the Bible, of choice food and oil. And a foolish man devours all he has. Even if he used a spiritual reason to devour all he has and have no savings, he would be, by biblical definition, a foolish man. Exactly. And so exactly. these two things appear to be at juxtaposition with each other. While I, I, and I think if you take a step up above it, you go, no, they're not. I'm not going to rest on the depth of my real estate portfolio. I'm not going to worship at that altar, and I don't want my kids to either. Uh, and so that's the eternal perspective uh, of idol worship and so forth. And on the other hand, I've got this this mandate by my maker to be wise. Christy? Yeah, it's interesting because I think sometimes we like to, and you can apply this to anything, swing to extremes and assume these things are mutually exclusive. And I think it's exactly like you're saying, Dave, we're going to hold these two truths where we're going to fix our eyes on eternal things. Our hope is in our eternal destination. And while God has us here today, we're going to do what we can with what we have where we are, which means just being okay. a good steward. And so what, what we know today is we're here and we need money as a tool to fund our lifestyle, to take care of our family after we're gone and so on. So we're going to do that in the name of stewarding God's blessings. And we're going to know exactly like you said, Dave, our hope is not in this. This is not the end game. We have an eternal perspective. It's not either or. 
It's both. You can hold both of those at the same time. Those truths. So, so well, people, well, go ahead, go ahead. Just, I was, I was just going to say that I've heard the phrase, you know, you're, you're so heavily minded, you're generously good. Yeah. You know. And then and, on the other uh, hand, you're so materialistic, you forgot God. Exactly. That's the other exactly. end of that, right? And so, so and really, we're not, we don't even have to play on that spectrum. We can go up above that at a completely different point on the diagram and let's go three dimensional instead of a linear perspective between materialism and spirituality as if there is as if that's the only part of the spectrum so i mean we're called all throughout scripture to manage things and love people the minimalists were on the other day and that's the title of their new book love people use things don't use people and love things I heard that conversation. It's it's great. It's a a great title for a book. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it just it encapsulates everything that you brought up. And uh, so, what's the legacy that we want these fourteen-year-old twins to have? We want them to have a high-quality life, living here with wisdom, which puts them financially in a position not only to take care of their own household first, or they're worse than an unbeliever, but also to be generous to widows and orphans because they have the money to be generous. Right. To widows and orphans. I was orphans. just going to say, if, they, and if, if the rapture comes, then, then they're in a higher place and not have to worry about all the crap yeah. down here. So it's, yeah, it's, I'm, it's I'm, I'd be happy to leave all of this behind and let it burn. Wouldn't exactly. make me mad at all. I'm ready to go. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean, this, it, it's crazier and crud out there. Come quickly, Lord. But I, I, I don't know the day or the hour. And scripture's pretty clear I'm not going to. And, and so, meantime, I got to live with what I got here and manage this thing uh, until I don't have to manage it anymore. And, gotcha. uh, and, and the beautiful part about that is the management of stuff and keeping stuff in its place spiritually is, and transferring that skill to your kids is character building. It builds your character. It builds your spiritual character. Well, well, the, the one thing I've learned is that they both started summer jobs this this year. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than going doing summer camps, they're they're they're, they're working so much they're making more than their father. <laughs> you know, who you know part time stay at home dad. I I work from home. I have been even before the pandemic. Yeah. And I'm like, your your checks are more than mine. But but the thing is, I've noticed this with with my younger daughter. She is more like we actually just just got to get lunch. She will go in and order for herself. I'm like, do you want to come with me? No. She never did that before. It's huge character building day. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's and, and see that's you, and what we're discussing here is not the actual amount. It's what's happened in their hearts as they've engaged in these act, in these earthly activities, how their spirits have grown, right? Exactly. And so that's exactly. the that's this uh, weird dance that we do uh, as Christians and as people of faith. That this weird dance between the earthly possessions. If you believe all earthly possessions are evil and to own anything is evil, that is not actually a Christian track. That's a track called Gnosticism. And right. it, was a, it was a toxic form, a, her, her, a, a heretical form of Christianity that popped up in the third century. And, I was going to say it goes back to the ancient Greeks, exactly. Yes. Yeah, and it, it was born out of that, but then they took it and put it over with an overlay on, uh, you know, what we would have called Judeo-Christian ethic and, and shifted yeah. it. And, so, and then that's, that's translated into today's world with people who are ignorant of theology and doctrine who start to say things like, well, all rich people are evil. Because they have money. Oh, and rich people can't go to heaven, which, by the way, is not in the Bible. But yeah. you, a lot of people quote the Bible that had never read it. <laughs> and so this is a very interesting discussion. Hey, I appreciate you calling in. Thanks for letting Thanks us for kick, the, kick that can around yeah, with you because it's, uh, you know, it's something we don't do often enough around here. We should stop and do that kind of thing. It's good. Yeah. Very, very good stuff. This is The Ramsey Show.
Hey folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. personality is my co-host today mitchell and courtney are with us in dallas texas it says on my screen you guys are debt free congratulations thank you very cool how much have you paid off we go ahead we paid off eighty six thousand dollars congratulations and how long did this take 22 months good for you and your range of income during that time uh 125,000 to 127,000 but in that time, Courtney took a pay increase, and I took a pay decrease. So that's why the such small increase. That works. But 22 months, so two years, you pay off $86,000, 43000 a year, make it 125. That's beans and rice. You were careful. Yes, sir. <laughs> what, kind of, uh, what kind of debt was the 86000 It was about $60,000 of college loans, uh, truck loan, uh, for $24,000 and uh, $2,000 of credit cards. Wow. How long have you two been married? Uh, four years in December. Okay. Cool. So what happened? What happened 22 months ago that changed your mind about this debt? I got a job about an hour away from uh, where we lived. Uh, this was right after buying a house the wrong way. And I was looking for a podcast to listen to. And uh, yours showed up. So I started listening to it. I was on board immediately. Uh, Courtney took a little bit of convincing, though, <laughs> and uh, just so happened that there was a money and marriage seminar coming to Dallas that year and uh, got Courtney to go to it, and she was all in. Wow. Okay. So that would have been Rachel Cruz and Les Parrot then? Yes. Yeah, they're funny. That's cool. That's a, that's a fun night. Good. That's a, that's a good seminar. Good, good, good. So, uh, Courtney, you go to that thing after your husband's been hanging out with this weird guy in a car for an hour every day, two hours every day, um, and, and you go to this uh, uh, seminar. What was going through your head? Um, at first, I, I mean, I knew the principles and everything, and so it was just more, I'm a very uh, visual person, so it was just actually like seeing it in practice and the way Rachel talked about it, it just really got to me and it just made complete sense so i think as soon as we got home from the seminar we sat down and we figured out how much debt we had and i think at that point in time when we saw the amount that's when i was really on board yeah like oh crud we gotta do something about this it's yeah. amazing how uh, events can be so motivating and so inspiring that even if they tell you something you already know, if they present it in a way like Rachel did, like Les did, in a way that, that fires you up and makes you care and gets you excited, that's what actually can be the catalyst, just because they presented it in a way that got you fired up. It absolutely was. Yeah, that's awesome. Way to go, guys. Way to go. All right, so two years, you crunch away. What was the secret during those two years to paying off $86,000? Uh, definitely working as a team. Uh, both of us kind of had our weak moments, so we really had to rely on each other to make sure we kept to our budget. Um, and then uh, making sure that we kept our eye on the prize. Like Chris Hogan says, we need to dream in HD um, and know exactly what we're working towards. So we just kept telling ourselves what our goals were, and we just needed to make it past paying off all the debt, and we could get there. Yeah, great job. Who uh, who were your biggest cheerleaders through this whole process? Honestly, all of our friends and family were really behind us. They were really in our corner cheering us on. And, in fact, my parents actually 
they they got so excited about it, they started the plan themselves and yeah. now they're they're on the dave ramsey plan too that's Look at you. awesome you, you've, you've spread this through the family way to go a ripple effect <laughs> yeah. that's really cool how old are you two i uh we're, we're both 27 yep okay and you're debt free eighty six thousand yeah. dollars paid off how's that feel surreal to say the least very freeing we can focused on uh, putting money towards everything we want. We recently found out that we're expecting. Oh, Yay! congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, we can just put the money towards the baby. Um, we were actually able to refinance our house in a Dave-approved manner. So <laughs> we're excited about that, too. That's awesome. Congratulations, I'm so, I'm so proud of you guys. What a great start you've got on life and for this baby. Very, very well done. And all because you just decide you're going to take control. Because you, this was no small feat. I mean, you you have really leaned into this. This is You've been hustling and grinding for two years. This is really tough, wasn't it? There, there were certainly some really tough days, but when I look back at it, it, it went by really quick. Mm. Good. Will there you ever you go. go back? Ever go back no, into no. debt? So next time you get ready to buy a car? Oh, we're actually saving up for a car so we can pay in cash. There you go. That's the right answer. You're there passing you the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, you Y'all are awesome. Very, very cool. Heroes, well done. Completely changed the family tree of this baby that's on the way. That's excellent, right. excellent, excellent. Got a copy of the Legacy Journey for you because that's what you've done. It's changed your legacy. A copy of the Total Money Makeover for you to give away to someone, get their journey started. Way to go. Mitchell and Courtney, Dallas, Texas, $86,000 paid off in 22 months, making 125 to 127 Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. All right. Three, two, one. We're debt free! Yeah! Whoop, 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 whoop. Way to go, you guys. Absolutely incredible. Wow, that's fun. That's awesome. Very fun. Zach is in Milwaukee. Hey, Zach, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave, how's it going today? Better than I deserve. What's up? Uh, I am currently debt free as of March. Pay off the last of my student loans, and I'm looking to move out on my own. I was curious: should I find a cheaper place to rent and save up the money and buy it with most of the house with a physical money, or should I take a 15-year mortgage? I'm a truck driver making about 58 a year before taxes. Okay. How much can you save a year? <sighs> As much as I can, I don't try. I don't no, spend a whole lot. As much as I can is not an answer. How much money can you save a year? If I go hard, I probably can save two thirds of my check. Okay, so let's call it thirty-five thousand, forty thousand. Somewhere in there, yes. Okay, and uh, how expensive a home are you thinking about buying? Uh, with me being not married and no kids that I know of, uh, I'm looking at about seventy thousand, maybe. Okay. And so, if you took, if it was thirty thousand that you thirty five thousand a year that you're saving, and you're going to buy seventy thousand, it would take you two years. Does that sound right? About right. Yes, I am yeah. currently not renting. I'm still with mom and dad, so that's going to be that expense. Are you over the road out. driving or home or uh, local driver? Uh, regional. I'm home on weekends. Okay. All right. So you're gone most of the time already. Most of the time. Yeah. And so. Um, you know, it'd be pretty tempting to me if you if you can buy something for seventy thousand in your area that that suits your needs. It'd be tempting to me if you could do that in two years to pay cash. We don't yell at people for taking out a fifteen year fixed rate mortgage where the payment's no more than a fourth of your take home pay. But we certainly always encourage the hundred percent down plan when we can. Yeah, and if, especially if you if you got you know seventy five percent of the way there. Let's say you rent and the the rent ate away at your your income more than you thought. Well, you're a lot closer than you would have been if you didn't try that plan. So it doesn't hurt to try for it and set that goal. Yeah, I mean, it, what if you saved up thirty thousand bucks and you put that down on a house and you got a little forty thousand dollar mortgage and, and you, you knock it out in a and year, you knock it out over the next two years yeah. or something? That's that's very doable too. Right. I mean, that's kind of a mid-range. That's not all the way to a 15-year fix. That's a like a two-year mortgage. But you take out a 15, but pay it off in two. Yeah. Uh, and you probably just get that at your local credit union, your local bank. You're not going to get a, a small amount like that for a short period of time. Uh, a traditional mortgage company, like a Churchill mortgage company, they don't they don't make a 35 or a 
$30,000 loan mm. because, the, you know, the Fannie Mae secondary markets, FHA won't accept those. Interesting. So you got to get fifty seventy five thousand dollars $75,000 minimum, and even then it's kind of expensive. Okay. So you got these under $100,000 mortgages. Most of the time you're going to do that with your local bank, your credit union, those kinds of things. So, hey, good stuff, man. You're thinking, Zach. Good question, you're yeah. You're thinking, you're thinking, you're thinking. This is The Ramsey Show. Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. If you want to talk about your life and your money, we're here to help. Nathaniel's with us in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Nathaniel. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for taking my call, Ramsey. Sure. How can we help? Hey, um, I just uh, finished to pay off my house, and I need some financial advice on what else to do with the money. Um, after you max out your 401k and your Roth or the wife and me, what other investments are, are good to keep doing so you can, you know, keep building your your portfolio? Way to go, man. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Baby step seven, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I never did any of the step. I just use biblical principles to, to grow okay. my money. I'll take but that. I did hear from your show a lot. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks. Good. So, uh, but anyway, you're you're one hundred percent debt free, right? Yes, yes. Good. Good. Okay. Well, what uh, what I have done and what we've recommended in those situations is do what you've done. That's max out all available anything to keep the government's hands off the money and any kind of a retirement plan, 401ks, as you said, Roth IRAs, as you said, if you've got any self-employment income of any kind, you can look at a self-employed pension plan, but even then that maxes out pretty quick. Um, And then what I personally have done is two things. You can do whatever you want, but this is what I have done and what we've recommended. I have invested in mutual funds. Now at this point, you want to invest in mutual funds that have what's called a low turnover ratio and their turnover okay. ratio is how often they sell the stocks inside the mutual funds if it has a a four percent turnover ratio that means 96 percent of the portfolio does not sell every year that's pretty cool so if it doesn't sell then as it increases in value there's no taxes on it until you do sell it So just like if you buy a single share of stock and it goes up in value, you do not pay taxes on it until you sell it. The other thing I do is I buy real estate that I pay cash for. So my first goal when I did, when I hit where you are years ago, is I just start dumping money in a low turnover mutual fund. You can do that like an S&P 500 fund, no load if you want. That's what I did and just dump money in there. And when it got enough, when I got enough money in that account to buy a piece of real estate, I'd buy a piece of real estate. Then I'd dump money in there until I got enough money in there to buy a piece of another piece of real estate and i would buy another piece of real estate because i'm i love real estate but you may or may not that's the two things i've invested in oh that's great great idea i appreciate that hey thank you man thanks for the advice i appreciate your call dave do you have a do you have a um a formula or percentage like in that scenario if someone was going to do both where they were going to do some real estate and some just just putting in an investment do you have any kind of percentage or you just whatever you're comfortable with whatever you're interested in just whatever you're comfortable with um Mine has resulted in being much heavier real estate. Yeah, because you love real estate. A, I love real estate, but the other thing that happened was 2008. Yeah. So I bought like uh, about $200 million worth of real estate in 2008 for 
about $20 million. Wow. About 10 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Real estate was just a, it was on sale. It was on fire sale. Yeah. So consequently, my net worth is lopsided just from the fact that I got, that I stole that stuff. Right, you know? right, right. And, and that changed it. But uh, so even more so than just investing steadily sure. into it. I just, I just caught that wave, the best wave of my entire 60 year life. Yeah. In terms of the market being way down and it was really good for people who had money. Right. To buy stuff while it was way down. And so, uh, and then we've developed these properties right. that, that, that our offices are in, and they're very expensive too. So I've got those two things that's caused mine to be very heavy real estate. You certainly would not want to do that if you don't want to deal with tenants. Yeah. And in my case, we've got uh, Rachel's husband, Winston, as you know, runs all of our uh, property management and our development and all that. Uh, and so I'm blessed that I have Winston and a company, uh, that a real estate that. company that does that for me day to day. So that takes a lot of the hassle off of me personally yeah uh, uh, i'm not over trying to make sure the heat and air is getting fixed on a house or something yeah. i'm not because i got to run this place and so but anyway all that to say that when you're first starting you know you you can you can change the ratio back and yeah. forth you could get into real estate and go i don't like it yeah and move back towards mutual funds or vice versa Let's talk about this real estate thing. So I'm thinking there's probably people listening right now that they may be in that spot where they are ready. They, they've maxed everything out and they want to get into real estate, but they've never done it before other than their own home that they've paid off. And they're looking to save up and pay cash for their first piece of real estate. Do you have any advice for them? Like, hey, you've got to do this. You're just getting into it. Here's what you need to know from someone who's done it. Um, Things to look out for, that type of thing. Yeah, the uh, cheaper the property the better the rate of return typically is mm -hmm. and the higher the hassle factor. Mm, interesting. So you can buy lower income stuff yep. in that end of town that uh, that your ROI, your math on it is really sweet. Okay. But your ROI on your time is your not. Headache. It's quite the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So on the other end of the spectrum is like uh, credit commercial real estate. So if you've got a, a uh, a, a household name as a tenant, or let's even go further, the post office yep. wants you to do a build a suit on a commercial. So the post office is your tenant, the mm -hmm. federal government. Right. Well, that's kind of like automatic. Right. You're going to get your check, right. right? You don't have to worry about the collections. And it's a 50-year lease. It's kind of just becomes, you just go to the mailbox, open it, there it is, and your mo there's your money. Uh, but your rate of return is way down. Gotcha. They don't give much of a cap rate, much of a rate of return on that. So like a Walgreens, there's a lot of Walgreens. Wal Walgreens doesn't uh, buy those properties. Mm -hmm. They do uh, build a suits and they get investors. And But Walgreens is a credit tenant, meaning that they're uh, you can actually take that contract to the bank and borrow against it. It's that strong. Wow. And so, but on that end of the spectrum, that's the least hassle. Mm -hmm. And so kind of in the middle is like just regular offices or apartments. And then on down a little bit, it's just a nice single family home. Mm -hmm. You're not going to make as much on that but you also are dealing with a little different class of person typically and how you're how they're how you're going to interact with them and the hassle factor goes down so that's thing one thing two would be um your money is made at the buy mm. and what happens on almost all of us including me on our very first investment property we get really excited yeah about being an investor yeah and you pay too much mm. you pay too much you should always buy investment properties at a discount mm. you should never pay appraisal ever okay and in a market like today that sidelines you right it's very difficult you don't have to, a chance very yeah. difficult to find deals today it's quite the opposite of 2008 mm -hmm. and, and so but but if you buy a two hundred thousand dollar property for two hundred thousand dollars it's a little tougher to get your roi on it but if you can pick up that two hundred thousand dollar property for 150 now you got that built-in 50 to start with and you're gonna always ha not only have the appreciation but then your rents on your rate of return on that 150 because yeah. your rents aren't based on what you paid for it they're based on what it's worth right Right, so right, right. That makes sense. A two hundred thousand dollar house rents for the same, whether you got a mortgage on it, whether you don't, whether you paid two fifty for it, or whether you paid one fifty for yeah. it, it still rents for the same amount. Yeah. And so uh, your rate of return on your rents and everything is changed by the money's made at the buy, hmm. which requires this most difficult thing in real estate, and that's patience. Yeah. And yeah. you're just shopping and shopping and you're not emotionally involved and you're looking for a deal. We're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. We're not trying to rip anybody off. But I just don't put money in stuff unless it's a deal. Yeah. And I own um, 
Because that's why why you're doing it is to make money. That's yeah. why you're doing it. If you remember that, that's going to help you resist that temptation to this, overpay. This is a trans a mathematical transaction. Right. Nothing else. Right. But there's something about real estate that's just very emotional. Yeah. For all of us, and uh, even if you're not going to live there, the first house I flipped, I made eight hundred bucks on. Wow. Translation: I almost lost money. <laughs> yeah. 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 If I hadn't crawled around under the stinking house and put the pipes in myself, yeah, I would have lost money. Lost money. So I didn't even make my labor back. Yeah. You know, yeah. I probably made a buck an hour on working on the stupid thing right <laughs> on my labor and didn't make a dime as an investor so yeah. that's unwise yeah but i was all excited i had to buy it and i thought it was a, it was a hud foreclosure i thought uh because it said foreclosure on it it meant deal mm. i didn't think that mm. but something in my emotions said it justified oh, it's, a, it's a foreclosure it justified it, it for is, you. it's got to have some i gotta work on it sure it's, i need some more some fixing up it's sure a, it's a fixer upper but i paid stinking obviously full price for it almost yeah because uh, it took 90 days to sell the stinking thing it didn't sell super fast and i had to work on it and i barely got out even with my own labor in it for free yeah so that's all about i was excited to be a real estate investor yep. now granted i was 21 years old too, sure. but but still that's the mistake that beginners make yeah so that's a good, good discussion good christy wright ramsey personality is my co-host today james childs is in the booth running the show ellie daniels is running the show and letting james think he is <laughs> she's the associate producer i'm dave ramsey and we'll be back This is James Childs, producer of The Ramsey Show. You can listen to all our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. Browse by topic or even sync clips to your friends. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king. And the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Christy Wright, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Her new book is on pre-sale. Take back your time, the guilt-free guide to life balance. She will be doing a free live event streamed tonight at 7 p.m. Central Time on YouTube and Facebook, all about balance. You'll learn what life balance is, what it isn't, the root cause of why you feel out of balance, and how to achieve your version of balance. RamseySolutions.com slash balance. Christy is an incredible communicator. You will thoroughly enjoy this event. And by the way, did I mention it's free? So tonight, 7 p.m. Central Time, YouTube and Facebook, RamseySolutions.com slash balance. Get your RSVP and it's going to be fun. It's going to be good. It's going to help you know not only what's keeping you from feeling balanced, but what to do about it. It's going to be great. Jose is with us in Detroit. Hey, Jose, what's up? Hello. Jose. Jose. Hello. Yeah. Hey. Oh, there he is. There he is. We found the phone. Good. What's up, man? Sorry about that. It was on mute. No troubles. How can we help? Um, so I'm looking to go back to grad school, and I'm kind of curious as to whether I should be taking out the student loans to do so. Well, Joe, do you listen to the show very much? Not very much. My brother is the one who actually put me on to the show recently. He, tr he tricked you. He did. Well, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm glad you're Your here. Your brother said, step up on the trap. And we're going to pull the rug out. Call, call your, brother, this. your brother, you owe your brother a punch in the nose. You do. He, he said, call this guy that hates debt and ask him if you should take out debt. And he's, he's got some popcorn listening to this call right now, Joe. Listen, no, we don't want you to take okay. out student loans, not for a okay. master's degree, not for any degree. We want you to save up and pay cash. What do you want to do? What, what do you uh, want to get your security. degree in? Hmm? Cybersecurity. Okay. What are you doing now? Uh, so I actually was working in IT. I actually recently quit my job. Uh, but So right now I'm not doing anything, but I was working in IT for a state agency. 
Okay. okay. So why mm-hmm. do you need a master's in cybersecurity to work in cybersecurity? We got cybersecurity people working here. None of them have even a four-year degree in it. Um, I don't know if you necessarily need one. So I didn't go to school because there are lots of people with cybersecurity degrees who have made it happen. Um, I didn't go to school for any of this. All this kind of just like fell in my lap and I kind of worked it out through work as I was doing it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to, I want to be really, really good at what I do. Mm-hmm. And so I, there's lots of knowledge that I don't have in right. over the years. There've been things that have come up just because I didn't have that, but uh, I learned from Google mm-hmm. um, and there are things that'll come up missing. So I'm just kind of looking to go to school for them to actually teach me the things that I need to know and then, and then go into the field. That is very wise. You're very smart in what you have described. Um, as a person who has a thousand people working for me, 440 of them are technology people, many of them in cybersecurity. Our cybersecurity guys were at work last night, as a matter of fact, had an issue. And um, so, uh, in other words, I'm the employer that you want to hire you later, in a sense. You follow mm-hmm. me? So mm-hmm. coming from that perspective, I am qualified to tell you, I would not require that you have a master's degree. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure getting a master's degree in information technology will not teach you what you're trying to get. Instead, you are already on the right track and in practical experience is what I'd be looking for, number one. Number two, I would want you to pick up some of the trade certificates, certification programs like Microsoft certs and some of those others. And there's plenty of really good one-off training in cybersecurity that would actually give you the information that you are looking for, the knowledge that you are looking for to be able to do the thing that you're wanting to do. Versus a master's degree is very academic. And uh, honestly, by the time you finish it, the stuff you learned will probably be obsolete. It's going to be dated. That's right. Joseph, I'm curious, why'd you quit your job? Because uh, I wanted to go to school. Mm. <laughs> um, so I was kind of feeling stuck at work for a little bit and uh, decided that I wanted to make the career change. Okay. Um, but wasn't quite sure how to get into it. Uh, so then school looked like to be a good option. And I actually got into uh, one of the best cybersecurity schools in the country. And, um, I want to get into what's it cost. So I want to be the Carnegie Mellon. What's it cost? Uh, Carnegie Mellon. What does it cost? Oh, what does it cost? Sorry. I thought you said what it's called. A hundred thousand dollars. Okay. I would not spend that. Okay. I really wouldn't. I mean, you can do what you want to do. You, you, but you, okay. and you obviously called some people. You hardly know who we are, and we're we're <laughs> we're screwing with your dream. So it's hard for you to hear all this. But I'm just telling no, you, as fine. as the employer that I mean, with a thousand person team here, four hundred tech people on the team, I couldn't give a rip less if you went to Carnegie Mellon or not. Just let me tell you, here's what here's what I would do instead if I were you, and it's going to still move you in the direction you want to go. I would find a company that you want to do cybersecurity yep. for. I would go take a pay cut. Yep. And do anything for them and study under them yep. and learn how to do the things you don't know how to do while on the job, while getting paid, which is still going to pay you more than you're making now, which is nothing. And better than that, they will also pay tuition. And you're not in $100,000 debt. But not to Carnegie Mellon. They'll just pay you tuition to go get the certs that will give you the knowledge that you need to do the job you're looking to go do. So we just saved you $100,000 in debt and you have an income while learning how to do the things you want to do. You just signed up for Harvard is what you signed up for. And the question is, is there an ROI when you pay full price for Harvard? And the answer is, in such a small percentage of jobs, will you make a return on investment on this that it is not a good investment? If you were my son, I would advise you the exact way we are advising you right now. And uh, that's not to trash Carnegie Mellon. It's to say that in the field that you're in, the rate of change of information is daily. It's daily. While you're getting this degree, some of the languages and code that you know right now will become obsolete. While you're getting this degree, the processes, some of the companies that provide security apps and provide security software will be out of business while you're getting this degree. It's the rate of change is blinding in the technology world. You have to be in a dead sprint to keep up with it when it is your career. 
But if you sideline yourself and go into crunchy academic world while you're doing this, I'm, I mean, I, and it's not to say that Carnegie Mellon isn't cutting edge. I suspect they are. You, some of you people are going to troll me on this. Just troll your butt away. I'm the one that will be hiring you. The, the, here's the thing, Joe. Well, you know who people want to hire? People they know that they've seen do the job on the job, not someone that has a certificate with a certain brand on it. So, someone they've worked with, someone they trust. They've watched them. Go be that person. If you had 100000 cash in the bank, I'd tell you not to do it. If you're borrowing money, I'm going to yell at you for doing it. <laughs> Don't do it, son. Now, you go do what you want to do, and you can call us later, and we'll still love you, and we'll still help you, even if you do stupid stuff. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. <laughs> money you would have if you didn't give it all to some bank or car company in the form of payments your most powerful wealth building tool is your income what if you got your whole income back instead of giving it to someone else by getting out of debt fire sally may kick her out of the house get rid of your lexus motor credit payments what would your life look like it's possible and it doesn't have to take as long as you think it all starts with Financial Peace University, the class that's helped nearly 6 million people learn the proven plan to get out of debt and become wealthy. But it's not just enough to learn the plan. you got to actually freaking do it. And the way you do it is starting with the budgeting app, the world's best budgeting app that's every dollar. And every dollar premium is part of the whole package. And all of this... You access it through Ramsey Plus, a Ramsey Plus membership. You can create the life where your money actually works for you instead of you just working for it. Time to get rid of the debt for good. Start your free trial of Ramsey Plus. Text TRIAL to 33789. That's TRIAL to 33789. Hannah is with us in Myrtle Beach. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hello, Dave and Christy. I'm excited and terrified to talk to y'all. Oh, don't be terrified. How can we help? <laughs> What's going on? Right now. <laughs> um, I'm looking for a little bit of advice. Uh, my husband and I are getting out of debt for our third time um, in our marriage, and I can never seem to get past baby step three. I can never seem to save the emergency fund. Um, my husband is a full-time pastor, a full-time roofer, and so he works all the time. Um, so I take care of the finances, I take care of the budget, everything. My question is, um, how can I have him help me when it comes to the budget and the finances and everything? He's willing to help, but he doesn't know how to help. Um, he also does not spend any money whatsoever, so he's an extreme saver. I'm the spender. So I'm just looking for a little bit of advice to get us onto Baby Step 3 and past Baby Step 3. I'm so tired of feeling like I'm doing it by myself. Hmm. I know this is not what you're asking, Hannah, but I want to go back to why you get yourself back into debt three different times. What's going on? Why do you keep going back it, into this thing? It is It is me just losing all power and will to not get back into debt. Um, I, get, I get past baby step two, and it's not huge debt. Like, I'm not I'm not in big debt right now, but it's sorry. I'm very nervous. That's okay. <laughs> your 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 um, husband's dad was a roofer. No, no, um, my husband is a roofer. No, I, um, what was your husband's he, dad do? Um, he right now he he's working at a plant. What um, was what did he do when your husband yeah. was growing up? Um, he worked in a chemical plant. Okay, in a factory. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Um. Your husband is a good man. He loves God. He works he and he works yeah. hard. He, however, is not functioning like your husband. He's functioning like your son. 
Right. You're the mommy, and you make all the adult decisions and carry all the adult responsibilities. He just goes to work. Mm-hmm. And if you actually gently call him out on that, um, he will respond because he loves his wife. Mm-hmm. And that would sound like this. Honey, I need your help. I can't carry the weight of all of this by myself anymore. Number one, I can't handle the stress. Number two, when I do it by myself, we go back into debt. And you work so hard. You're such a good man. But I have got to have you emotionally carry your half of the finances of this household. Mm-hmm. And, and here's one thing I would add. That's Hannah. a way of saying man up. Here's one thing I would add. Yeah. <laughs> when you have this conversation, when you have this conversation, which is, is going to be so important, I want you to be extremely specific with what help looks like to you. Yes. Because if you say, help me, and he says, okay, I'll help you, and then six months goes by and you're His mad. His mind he's, help is it more overtime. Yeah. You need to be very, like, mm-hmm. even when you say, I need help, I don't even know that you know. This will be good for you to think about, okay, here's what this would look like. Does it look like paying bills? Does it look like showing up for the budget meeting? What does it look like specifically, tactically, visually, and then connect there and allow him to speak into it, obviously. But uh, expectations have got to be crystal clear. I'm not making any more financial decisions by myself. There you go. There's a, there's a right. great one. You have to help me make yeah. the financial decisions. We're going to look at the budget together, and you're going to feel the strain of the bill paying with me. Yeah, yeah. Because you feel the weight when the stuff is, when it gets tight. You get the, you get the sweat in the palm of your hands and across the top of your eyebrow. You get that feeling, that tightness in your throat. He doesn't have that mm-hmm. feeling at all. He needs that feeling. It will change, and it will help you because the good news is he's a saver, and so he's going to hold you accountable. Now, the bad news is yeah. he's going to hold you accountable. So your your days of being in control by yourself are about done. Yeah, yeah. you going to be careful with what yeah. you wished for because you're, you're going to have somebody to report to with all this spending oh, and going yeah. back into debt. But it's going to be a great thing. It's going to be such a healthy conversation where you're on the same page. Let, let's do it. He's yeah. meeting you there. Let's but. do it this way i'm going to put you in ramsey plus for a year free as my gift and and the way you can phrase the conversation then is honey i need your help i can't do this by myself anymore it's wearing me out i need you to help me carry the weight of the adult decision making of the money i've been doing it by myself Mm -hmm. and i just can't do it anymore i've got to have you help me do that and the way we're going to start that is we're going to go through this class together right here online we'll sit on the couch and do it after the kids go to bed and I know you're tired. So am I. I'm sick and tired, though. And so you've got to help me with this. And just like if you came to him and said, honey, I'm sick. I need you to put the kids to bed. He would do Mm -hmm. that. He would do that. He would carry his share of the weight. (laughs) He would do chores that he normally doesn't do if you asked him for help because he loves you. Mm -hmm. But you need to be very specific because, guys, we don't do subtlety. You have to tell us what it is. And then say it again a couple more fair. hundred times. Just well, in case. if you get him in this class together and you guys are making the budget together on every dollar and you're making your decisions together, it's going to give you what you want and some things you didn't even want that are coming your way. <laughs> but you're going it, it's going to change the whole thing. So that'll be a way you can do it. So you hold on and I'll pick up. Uh, I'll have I'll pick up. I'll have Kelly pick up <laughs> and get you signed up for Ramsey Plus. And you can you can do the stuff you're supposed to do then, and you guys get in there and, and get into Financial Peace University, get the every dollar budget going together, because this is what's going on. So, Christy, there's a, a thing, and you guys out there listening, I'm gonna piss some of you off, but just get ready. I'm not. It's not. It doesn't come from a mean place. It's observation, and it's not always true. But in a lot of blue collar families, Mama takes care of the money, and Daddy does the work. Mm-hmm. And that's a modeling thing of what it means to be a husband that he got from his dad. Mm. And so he moved in and now mama's taking care of the money. And, but there's a, um, in, in oftentimes in, in white collar families, it can be the same way if you grew up in a blue collar family. Because the generational, what's taught and passed exactly. down. Exactly. Yeah. How it's taught to you who's this in is charge. This what you do. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, in, in your case, you grew up in a single mom's household where she's making all the decisions. And so you would never even think of not being involved in the decisions in your household. Right. 
It wouldn't occur to you because right. of your upbringing. It's interesting, though, because Matt and I have had such interesting discussions as newlyweds and still present day of how we, as a generation, but also as a couple, do things different than our parents did, not only because of how they worked, but even just uh, raising kids and expectations. It, it all is different. We, we mm-hmm. have to define it for ourselves, what that's going to look like. And you, but, and you, do, you do have to clarify these you do. where these roles came from. Yep. Rachel does that, a good job with that in the Know Yourself, Know Your Money book and the Know Your self money assessment for couples that's another thing you can do is jump into that because that gets into the family of origin what how family how money was handled in the household you grew up in because that affects then how you're communicating with your spouse about it yep so you could take that know yourself money assessment for couples you ought to you guys a bunch of you ought to take it uh you can get it at ramsey solutions in the store it's inexpensive and it's really really a, a powerful assessment it'll open up things for you like cray cray man it's nuts it's it blow your mind This is The Ramsey Show. We were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org backslash budget. We absolutely believe in it. personality number one best-selling author is my co-host today on the debt-free stage in the lobby of ramsey solutions andrew and amy are with us hey guys how are you good hey, good welcome where do you guys live fredericksburg virginia oh wow nice drive down to nashville yep or flight or whatever we drove yeah good to have you and how much debt have you two paid off uh, two hundred and forty-seven thousand three hundred fifty-two dollars and ninety-eight cents. Whoa! How long did this take? Seven years, four months. All right. And your range of income during that time? Uh, started around a hundred thousand and up to around one seventy. Nice. Man. So I've got a feeling, based on those numbers, the number of amount of time and the number of dollars that you might have paid off your house. Yep, we did. I'm looking at weird people. <laughs> Way to go, y'all. A hundred percent debt-free house and everything. Yep, yeah. everything. How old are you guys? Uh, I'm 34. And I'm 35. You're 34 years old with a paid-for house in Fredericksburg. Yep. That's unbelievable. That's amazing. What's this house worth? Uh, probably close to 280, 300 now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's Look at amazing. You guys. Wow, you're so weird. Yep. <laughs> you are so freaking weird. I love you. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah, you're too young and pretty to be 100% debt free. <laughs> now, y'all are amazing. This is just amazing. Well done. What put you on this journey seven years ago? Uh, well, um, we actually met, um, and, and I had already paid off my debt uh, before student loans, paid those off, bought my house. Um, and then we met, and Amy had some loans, so we went right back at it. Yeah. Um, and before we got married, um, we just agreed we're going to do this. Um, so she actually started before um, before we got married. Mm-hmm. She was already on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when we got married, we cash flowed our wedding, honeymoon. How long, how long have you been married? Uh, six, six years, uh, a couple weeks ago. Okay. So you, you had the house for seven then. Mm-hmm. That's where the 7.4 comes from, seven yep. years and four months. But the whole time y'all been married, this whole six years, you've been knocking on the house, knocking on her student loans, and then knocking on the house. Yep. Yeah, we paid her student loans off in 2017. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we cash flowed a couple of upgrades to our house, a new kitchen. Um, we needed a bigger car. car. Sure. Yep. Started having kids, so we had to, yeah. you know, had to get a new car, we cash flowed, all that stuff, and then we right, went right back into the house. So what in the world? Why Why does a young guy, Henry, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, a- Andrew, Amy, you marry this guy, and the first thing he starts talking about is how quick we're going to get out of debt. Right. <laughs> like, y- y- like that. that's a real romantic conversation. <laughs> right, and it happened pretty quickly. It was just like student loans need to be taken care of. Uh, um, and Kind of task-oriented, isn't he? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. very much. A little bit. Very much. <laughs> so, Amy, was this was this a new concept for you? Like when he's talking about paying off the student loans, paying off the house, is this like okay? What are what are you talking about? Uh, yes. Or were you already kind of like familiar with Dave I, and being debt free and all that? Not familiar with Dave. I knew I wanted to pay off my student loans, but yeah, yeah. it was yeah. So uh, it was just a process. Um, I was just a hundred percent jumping on board. I was. I grew up with, you'll always have a mortgage, you'll always have a car payment. And I was okay with that. But after we just, or like, we don't want to live that way. Yeah. He so, changed so Andrew, yeah. where, where yeah. did you learn this whole thing? I was actually trying to think about what the first time I heard, heard of you was, and I can't remember. Mm. Um, but I just, I know every day going to work, coming back, I listen to, to the podcast every single day. Um, wow. Driving in, driving back, and then I'd tell her, hey, did, I heard this yeah. on the show. Hey, let's listen to this one. So we would listen to little snippets all the time. Uh, so it was kind of always on um, and just always on my mind. It's in it's the cool. background of your life. Yeah. It's oh, amazing yeah. how motivating it can be when you're on the journey to listen to people doing their debt-free scream or just listen to the advice, the answers that keeps you motivated because the journey can be long. But y'all did it. It was oh, very yeah. long. And that was definitely a key thing was just listening in and hearing other people doing their scream and knowing one day, one day that'll be us mm. yeah. that's cool okay you're 35 years old you have a paid for house make 170 what do you guys do for a living I get to stay home with my babies <laughs> oh, love awesome. it awesome yeah, and, and I do uh, software project management excellent excellent very good okay um, what is the secret you hear me mm -hmm. ask this all the time yeah what is the thing you have to do if you want to be you when you grow up? I mean, if you want to be debt-free house and everything, and you're 35 years old or 45 years old or 55 years old, what's the secret to getting out of debt? I think the secret is really just paying attention. Um, I know for a while I just, you know, making money, not really knowing where things are going. And then once I just said, all right, well, before I even set a goal, let me just see what I'm doing. What am I spending my money on? So actively tracking it, um, actively sitting down, doing the budget, um, talking about it, even though it's, you know, sometimes painful to really try to think about it um, and have those conversations. But really open, honest communication, I think. It was it was difficult for me. It was very difficult to sit down every month to have that budget talk. But seeing the spreadsheets that he made and we had it taped on the bathroom door and filling out the debt thermometer and we had like a little game to pay off our house, just seeing that it was, that was it. That made it worth facing yeah. what, cause really doing that budget meeting is like looking in the mirror. It's like, and, and you don't always like what you see, you know, it's like, uh, you know, uh, I got to deal with this every month. And that's, that's what the dread is, isn't it? Yes. To say, I got to, I got to deal with me. I got to deal with what's going on. And, and, and because I know I'm going to push this against this goal that we're sharing and I do want the goal, but I don't always want to do what it takes to get to the goal. Right. Well, and good for you guys for doing that, for having that look in the mirror, for, for facing it every single month, because I think that moment you're describing is the thing so many people avoid. And because they avoid it, they never get to the, your shoes. They never make the change, but simply having the courage to face it mm -hmm. and then do mm -hmm. something about it that i mean that's what kept you on this path that's i mean you right guys word. are amazing that's the right word courage yeah that's, that's the right word christy that's exactly right way to go you guys Thanks. you're freaking heroes it's amazing who are your biggest cheerleaders outside the two of you uh my family uh my parents came with us I mean, right. it wasn't just my family but our family just they were always yeah. behind us always asking you know they like came you down said, to cheer you on they did and an excuse to hang out with the grandkids <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah i love it very cool way to go mom and dad good stuff and and the kiddos are with you. What are their names and ages? Uh, we've got Henry. He's five. Mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor, she's three. Mm -hmm. And Artie, he's one. Way to go, so Artie. So cute. You got this, man. So cute. I love it. Well, we've got a copy of the Legacy Journey for you because for sure that's your next chapter to completely change this beautiful family tree. A whole new direction because of you guys. And I, um, So how much are your investments? Have you already added all those up? Uh, yeah, we have. Um, I think last time we looked, our net worth is probably around 700 now. So you're on your way to Baby Steps Millionaire. Oh, yeah. Be there in no time. We'll, we'll be back. <laughs> you'll, be there, you'll be there by the time you're 40. Easy. We hope so. Easy. Yeah. Easy. Amazing. Way to go.
There it is. That's how it works right there, people. You're watching it happen in real time. Wow. Amazing. Good stuff. Also, a copy of the Total Money Makeover for you to give away to somebody and start their journey and uh, disrupt their whole American life. Not a bad thing to do at all. I love it. All right. Amy and Andrew. Henry, Eleanor, and Artie. 247,000 paid off in seven years and four months. House and everything you're looking at and listening to weird people making 100 (laughs) to 170. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. We're We're debt-free. Yeah, baby. That's how it happens right there. How fun is that? Those kids don't even know. They don't even know what their parents have just done for them. I mean, that's incredible. That's a complete change. Yeah, they're young enough that they, they may have some vague memory of this weird day, but uh, that dad and mom, uh, they, they busted the whole thing. The they sacrifices. busted the whole thing. It's completely changed. Because when you're 35 years old and you don't have a house payment, you understand how much money you're going to have? That's tens of millions of dollars if you just invest the house payment yep. for the next 30 years. Yep. 35 to 65, put 2000 bucks in a month in a calculator and see what it does for you. It'll blow your freaking mind. I mean, it's tens of millions of dollars because they're going to be millionaires probably, I said five years. It won't take that long. Probably take two before they break through that because the house is going to continue to go up in value. The current investments are going to go up in value and they're going to be adding to them. So they'll be baby steps millionaires well before they're 40. and, And being a millionaire doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is you took control of your life. The millionaire is just a scorecard. And it gives you the options to be generous, the options to do things. Those three kids will never know debt. They'll never know student loan debt. Yeah. They'll never know car debt. They'll never know house debt unless they misbehave and don't do what their parents taught them. Yeah. Wow. Pretty cool stuff. Touchdown, baby! Woo! This is The Ramsey Show. Right, Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. Our question today comes from Blinds.com. They have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Means even if you mismeasure, you pick the wrong color, they'll remake your window blinds for free. Free samples, free shipping, new promos all the time. You save even more. Use the promo code Ramsey to get the best possible deal. Today's question comes from Lissa in New York. She writes, I recently left my career as a management consultant and am considering a couple different options to create my own business. I have $42,000 in credit card debt, but I have $45,000 in cash on hand to pay it off. What should I do? Pay off all my debt and hope to get a business loan later or use my savings to begin the business opportunities that will generate an ongoing income stream within six months. Well, we don't have to know all the details of this to say, of course, we don't want you to take out business debt. Business loans are just like personal loans in the fact that they're debt and they're bad and they're a risk and they're yours and you have to be the one to pay them. So we don't recommend that ever. The good news is, uh, Lissa, you have savings to be able to pay off that debt and become debt free. You'll still have $3,000 in cash on hand to start your uh, emergency fund, your fully funded emergency fund, which would be three to six months of expenses. And then you save up to cash flow, whatever business growth or startup costs you may need. The thing that I would challenge if I had Lisa on the phone, what I would ask, what is your business and what costs do you really have? Because a lot of times, Dave, I get this kind of question and people think, oh, I need $50,000 to start my business. I need 
ten thousand dollars start my business and you don't you don't in many industries you don't some you might need some startup costs but in many of them you can start with your baby version of your idea your scrappy version of your idea and as the business is validated and you get cash into the business that cash can fund the growth you started this this organization on a card table in your living room yeah and uh, we don't know what her business is. She was a management consultant before. And if you're going into consulting, you don't need much money. You need, yeah, yeah. You need, <laughs> right. you need, you need a computer and some consulting gigs. It's your, it's your services and, you you're know, charging for yeah, there. That's the thing. So you don't have to have a lot. Now, so I completely agree with Christy. And it'd be ridiculous to pay off the credit card debt to run and take about business loans. That's just trading. That's just a dog chasing its tail. You're, you're just trading one for the other. You're just, you're, you're kidding yourself. You didn't really do anything. You just swapped hands. Um, so what I, what I would, the only thing I might consider, but you'd have to make a really tough case for it. And I would argue with you, I'll warn you ahead of time that let's say you had a business and you said, all right, I need $10,000 worth of equipment. There's no possible way, not just to be optimal, but there's no possible way to start without some inventory, some equipment, something, Mm -hmm. and, uh, out of Mm 40,000. And you could show me how you can make ten thousand back in two months. Mm-hmm. Yep. As and, and I and you'd have to make me believe you. And believe me, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna push you hard on it, okay? Because it's what I would do if somebody worked for me came in here and said I want to spend ten thousand, yep. and um, I would say, okay, when are we gonna make that money back? Because that's the whole idea of business is if you're gonna spend money, but putting ten thousand dollars on a five year payout. And calling that a business, that's dumb. Mm -hmm. That's just dumb. So you would need an almost instantaneous break even to sell me on that idea. But if you could do that, I would say pay off the top 32,000 of your debt snowball, put 10,000 in the business, and then two months later, you're debt free. Yeah. That would be okay. Yeah. But but you'd have to really prove it. And it's not, I want to open my business and this is optimal. I mean, it's like you have a computer. I want a better computer. That's that's you don't need no, that. You don't have okay. to have that. I want to be a photographer and I already have a camera, but I want a better camera. Mm-hmm. No, no. Uh, this is what I spend my life around Ramsey doing mm-hmm. all the time. If somebody wants to do something, I said, well, make something with what we've got. Right. We have all these things and well, it'd be optimal. I know it'd be optimal, but, we, you know, optimal doesn't equal profit. Optimal equals spending money. Yeah. And when you spend money, it lowers your profit. This is a ba- business equation here, yep. people. So really, really good question you've got. We don't have the nuance and the details of your situation, but the, the concept being here, no debt, no how, no way, start something and you are the secret sauce, not the crap you would buy with some of this money. I had a question, Dave. You've been talking about no debt for over 30 years and you still regularly get questions, should I take out this loan? It's not just new people either. It's not just people that like it's their first time calling in, first time listening to the show. Do you think that they think they're going to get a different answer? No, no. They they want someone to say it out loud for them. Okay. If they're it, now, she could be new. Sure. I mean, sure. she could have just well, joined then, us on YouTube sure. a month ago or sure. something. That's yeah. possible. But the number of people that call in go, I've listened to you for five <laughs> years, and I'm thinking about getting a car loan. You know. <laughs> yeah, and, like, and we're like, no, uh, no, you really weren't listening, were you? But we <laughs> we want to be snarky, and yeah. sometimes we are, but. Uh, but but overall, but what happens is is that they were listening and all this stuff kind of worked over here, and then they have this new situation. Mm, it, and it's it different. Feels like it's different. It's different. I'm special. Or, or I really know I shouldn't do it, but it's like I'm going to let those people on Ramsey show be my conscience and mm-hmm. speak. They're going to speak into my head, the little angel on my shoulder going, "Don't do it." Right. Where the, all the devils are out there in the world going, oh, yeah, it's no big deal to borrow money. Yeah. You get the airline miles on your credit card yeah. and all that bull crap, you know. Yeah. And so that, that that's, um, but, you know, we get to be the angel on the shoulder sometimes. But, but um, yeah, it, it is as if we were inconsistent or something. Yeah. We're not. We it's get it all the time. Always get the same answer. Dan is with us. Dan's in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hi, Dan. What's up? Hi, Dave. How are you today? Better than we deserve. What's up? All right, great. There's a bucket list item to check off for me. Um, <laughs> my my wife and I have been on Baby Step 2 for one year. Uh, mm-hmm. We started the plan last July with $106,000 in debt, making 89000 not including our first or second mortgage. Uh, at the time, our first mortgage was 30000 and our second one was 50000 By those standards, you teach us to put the second mortgage into Baby Step 6. Um, so fast forward to now. We now make about 120000 a year, and we're over halfway through baby step two with about $47,000 left. 
Um, the second mortgage is down to 44000 which now would have us put our second mortgage in baby step two. Ah. So do we recalibrate things there? Because if the second mortgage is in baby step two now, now we still have $91,000 in baby step two instead of the forty seven. That is an interesting uh, and only scenario. 19000 on our initial mortgage, so that should be paid off by May of 2023. Sometimes the way to answer the detailed nuance to a wicked, weird scenario, which this is, is to pan back to the principle that caused us to put the, the step in place in the first place. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, Dave, do I tithe on this little thingy over here? Well, let's pan back and say the whole reason for tithing is giving. And God wants to teach us to be generous. He's trying to change our character and turn us into givers. Let's start with that as the principle, and then we can figure out if this little nuanced corner of this tithing question, just give, you know, just give. You're, God's not going to be mad at you. Just give. And so in this case, we're going to pan back and not be quite that snarky because I like the question. It's very interesting. It's an evolving situation, fluid situation. So I'm going to pan back and say, okay, why did we say that if you're – Second mortgage is more than half your annual income. Push it to six. The reason we, baby step six, the reason we said that was it's going to take too long. You're going to be stuck right. in baby step two. If you make 100000 and you have a $200,000 second mortgage, you're going to be stuck in baby step two forever. Okay, mm -hmm. so we pushed it to six and said, you probably want to refinance your first and second, roll them together, and then you've got a plan to get your home paid off, but you've got this monster, but but if you got a tiny little second mortgage, treat it like a credit card debt and get, let's get you know, it's a mosquito, let's smack it, get it done, and, and in there. So your situation has changed, which changed the equation and said, now it's under half, the reason we said this was it's going to take too long, and so the way we answer the question is, if we put it in baby step two now, because your situation has evolved, is it going to take too long? Then you can answer the question, and I don't care which one you do. Either one's okay. You can yeah. put it in six, yeah. or you can do it now. The trick is don't get stuck in two so long that right. you quit, give right. up, and don't get don't finish your get-out-of-debt plan. You get if you need to leave it over in six and roll it into a new first mortgage, fine. Yeah. Fine. If you, if you can stick it over there and punch it in the head, be done with it, that'd be awesome too. But the whole concept was don't let it take too long. Good. Good question. Christy, good show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Christy Wright, you can hear her tonight at 7 p.m. Go to RamseySolutions.com and get your tickets. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer for The Ramsey Show. This episode is over, but if you heard about an event, product, or service and didn't have a chance to write it down, don't worry. We list everything you've heard about during this episode in the podcast show notes section or head to theramseyshow.com. Thanks for listening. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Welcome to an Everyday Millionaire Theme Hour. What is an Everyday Millionaire Theme Hour? We're going to talk only to people that have a net worth of $1 million or greater. Why are we going to do that? Because if you want to be wealthy, the best thing you can do is find out what wealthy people do and do it. Not what someone with a theory has, not with a broke finance professor with tenure and what he thinks, not what your broke brother-in-law thinks with his political opinions at Thanksgiving, but what do really wealthy people do? See, broke people sitting around and talking about being wealthy is like a bunch of fat people sitting around talking about being in, in the Olympics. It's not going to happen, okay? And, and you know, this, we're, we're all in that same boat. We have to figure out, if you've been divorced 14 times, I hope this new marriage works for you, but I'm not reading your book on marriage. You're what's known as a failure. I'm not doing it. I hope this one works. I love you. You, you can be my friend, but I don't need your, I don't want to follow what you've been doing because it's not had a good track record, darling. 
you know? And so what we want to do is we want to talk to not people with political agendas, not people with the news talking heads, with a with some 26-year-old wrote the script for them and they're reading it out of a camera. We're going to talk to real human beings who have a net worth of a million dollars or more and find out how they did it. So then you can decide if you want to do it. Well, a million dollars isn't much money anymore, Dave. You're right. But it's more than not having a million dollars. Considerable more. Well, Dave, millionaires are all... They're all what? You you really think you know what you're talking about? Maybe you need to listen to this hour. If you have a $1 million or greater net worth, your net worth is what you own minus what you owe. Your assets minus your liabilities is your net worth. It is not a feeling. It is not a moral discussion. It is a mathematical fact. It's not a million dollars worth of income. There are lots of people that make a million dollars a year and don't have nothing because they spend $2 million a year. And, and they're called Congress, right? So, I mean, this is this is what you've got to do, right? You have to figure out what a real millionaire is and then go, at, that's the at least the first wealth target. Now, later, if you want to get a jet, you could be a billionaire. Later, if you want to have seven cars, you could be a billionaire. Later, if you want six houses, you could be a billionaire. But millionaires are none of those things. Millionaires typically drive used cars. They're steady with their investing. They did not inherit their money. They're not evil rich people who stole and beat up the little man and took his money out of, took his welfare check out of his hand and ran off with a cackle like a cartoon or something. (laughs) This is not real people. This is crap you hear from broke people that have wrong impressions about people that have built wealth. So let's talk to some real ones. The phone number, 888-825-5225. David and Kristen are starting us off from Dallas, Texas. What's you guys' net worth? Dave, it's about $1.8 million. Cool. Give me a little breakdown on that by category. How much in retirement, how much in house, and so on. It's about 50% retirement funds, 25% real estate, and 25% other accounts. So about 500 in real estate, about 900 in uh, retirement, and about 400 in miscellaneous. Right? That's right. Did I do that right? That's right. Sure. Okay. How old are you guys? We are both 52. Cool. And how much of this 1.8 million did you inherit? No money, just a few small family items. But your net worth did not come from wealth wealth given to you by family members. No, actually, we inherited about $5,000 when my grandmother died. And I think as soon as that money hit the bank account, uh, one of our air conditioners went out and we had to replace it for about $4,800. Gotcha. So as a household income, what has been your worst year financially income, the, when you, like when you started or something, and your best year income? Well, when we first got married, I think we had a combined income of about forty five thousand uh-huh. dollars. Now we make about one eighty to two twenty depending on bonuses. Okay. What do you guys do for a living? I am an engineer who works as a sales manager uh-huh. and Kristen teaches high school English and yearbook. Ah, very good. So Kristen, your degree's in education, I assume. It's in English. In English, okay. And uh, then, David, you're, you're an engineer, you said, right? That's right. I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, and then I went back to school and got an MBA. Okay, cool. What were your GPAs? Well, mine was uh, 3.7 overall and 3.9 in English. Okay. I was a B student in engineering, and in business school, my GPA was about 3.9. Yeah, you were an adult student by then. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. Good. Very good. Okay. So how much of this debt is here because you used borrowed money to create wealth? Probably zero. I, I don't think I ever went on margin to make an investment or anything. Okay. So you have 900000 in almost a million in your retirement alone. 
which, by the way, this is textbook case study right here. You guys, you hit all the numbers almost identical to the averages. Uh, the typical millionaire is 51 years old. Uh, the typical millionaire has one third of their income or of their net worth in their house. I mean, you guys are just right down the line. And so the the investing that you've done into retirement, do you feel like you've gotten good rates of return, excellent rates of return, or poor rates of return? I mostly invest in index funds, usually S&P 500 index funds. Mm -hmm. So we usually get market rates of return. Right. Okay. So medium, medium to good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Um, Are you guys uh, book people or TV people? Do you read or you watch TV? Kristen is definitely the book person. Yeah. Uh, The English teacher. That makes sense. Okay. Um, Very interesting. Okay. Quickly, what would yeah, be the? Yeah, we do both. I read about a book a week, but um, uh, Dave watches TV more. I only get to watch TV during the summers. <laughs> okay. Uh, what would the, be the advice you two would have for the twenty-five-year-old couple that's listening, that's just like you were? Can they get there? Well, I think financially, we've done most things right. Um, what I would advise the younger me to do would be to pay more attention to our day-to-day finances. It's, it's easy to tell yourself that you're busy with work or kids or life and not have your eye on the ball. And there have been a couple of instances where we weren't paying close attention to our finances and it, it sort of cost us. Yeah, I understand. Way to go, you guys. I'm so proud of you. Congratulations. First generation millionaires every day millionaires it's an everyday millionaire theme hour if you have a net worth of a million dollars or greater no matter how you got it call and tell us your story the phone number is 888-825-5225 It's an everyday millionaire theme hour. If you have a net worth of $1 million or greater, we want to talk to you this hour so you can explain how it is you did that because other people might want to do it. Well, Dave, all rich people are evil. You know what? That's ridiculous. There are evil people in every category. Black, white, skinny, fat, old, young, southern, Northerner, Southerner, Northerner, rich and poor. There are jerks and evil people in every category, and there are vast majority of people are not. The vast majority of people are great people in any category, in any demographic. So for you to ascribe wealth only to wealthy people does not say anything about the facts. It says something about you. It says who you are. It says how you have a toxic, warped view of the world. You're bitter, jealous, and angry. It doesn't mean that what you said or even believe is the truth. So that's ridiculous. Everyone inherited their wealth. No, some did. And they didn't do anything wrong when they did that, by the way. I thoroughly encourage you to build some wealth and leave it to your children. I hope you can, each of you listening can make your children millionaires. Wouldn't that be neat? Especially if you taught them how to have the character to handle it and be generous to others as a part of the equation. Wouldn't that be a neat thing? So I encourage you to create millionaires through inheritance. That's fine. I'm not mad about that. But this idea that the only way you can become wealthy is through an inheritance is a statement that says that the little man can't get ahead. And that's statistically factually not true. We did the largest study with Ramsey Research in conjunction with another research team, airtight research techniques, 
the controls, the statistical factors were dialed in airtight because we knew some of you people bitching, moan, and whine about this study. And so we knew we had to have it right. It's completely dialed in. We studied over 10,000 actual real millionaires. 79% inherited zero. 5% inherited a very small amount, like our last caller got $5,000. That did not make them a millionaire. Another 5% inherited substantial money after they were already millionaires. So your causation from a research perspective, from a statistical analysis perspective, what causes people to be millionaires, 89% of them did not become millionaires. That's all of them did not become millionaires because of an inheritance. So when you little piss ants out there with your liberal theologies running around, your liberal p political stance run around telling everybody that the only way you can become wealthy is to inherit it, you're statistically a moron. Was I unclear? I hope not. I hope not. I hope because it just pisses me off because what you're doing is you're saying that America is dead. Capitalism doesn't work, that the little man can't get ahead. And the little man has a better chance of getting ahead in America today than in any country, in any economic system, in the history of mankind. That is a statistical fact. And when you lie and you tell people that, you, that they can't do it, you are what's known as an ignorant dream killer. Pisses me off. So that's why we did this study, just to prove that you were wrong. No, not really. But it's one of the side benefits, which is kind of nice. So the deal is that it, I don't mind if you inherited the money. I don't care if you hit the lotto. And got it, became a millionaire. I'm happy for you. I'm not going to tell people that that's the best way to do it, though, because statistically, the best way to do it is the way you're going to hear over and over and over this hour. Kevin is with us and Jamie in Spokane, Washington. Hey, guys, what's your net worth? Right at one million, Dave. Good for you. How old are you guys? We are both 38. Oh, young ones. Look at you. Not even yeah. 40. Ding, ding. All right. Give me the mix on that. What's the breakdown? How much retirement? How much real estate? So on. So the house is right about 500. Um, IRAs and 401k is about 460. And then the rest is a combination of checking, emergency fund, HSA, and 529. Did a little cash then. Okay, cool. Yep. Good for you guys. Way to go. How much of this did you inherit? Not a dime. Zero, zero. What's your best working year since you started working? Household income and worst working year since you started working? Household income. Uh, I started out at 40 and we're sitting at right about a hundred right now. Good for you. What do you guys do for a living? Um, I'm a bridge engineer mm -hmm. and I stay at home with the kids. Mom. Good for you. Uh, so what were your degrees in? Uh, mine's a bachelor of science in civil engineering. Engineering, obviously. Yeah. Okay. And I have a BA in public relations. Excellent. Excellent. Good. What were your uh, GPAs? Uh, about 3.45, and Jamie was about 3.8. Ah, okay. All right, good for you. So how much of this wealth is there because you borrowed money to create wealth? Uh, none. Zero, okay. All right. Not a trick question because everybody says you got to have money to make money. You know, yeah, that's a great lie that's out there because what you guys have done is you've just done your investing and you got your house paid off, right? Exactly. And we are, we wanted to say like, all we've done over the last 16 years is follow the baby steps. And when we've stuck to them better, we've done better and we don't stick to them as well. We've slowed down a little bit, but we are firmly baby step millionaires in our minds. For sure. For sure. You are at a 38 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of you, man. How's that feel? Weird. Yeah. <laughs> What advice would you give to a 23-year-old that's listening? Can they still do this? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We, I would say that, um, uh, you know, we, we were a little less intentional with our investing for a while because I didn't understand things well enough and was afraid to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so learning more about 
um, your options would be good. And then mm-hmm. also um, the closer that you follow the plan. I mean, because for us, the key was following the baby steps. So wow. the closer you follow that, the faster it'll go. Amen. And we've never, ever gone into debt aside from a mortgage. But we um, there were definitely times over the last decade where we've been a little less intentional. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with our purchasing choices mm-hmm. than we could have been. And I think we could have done this faster if we had been a little more intentional. Mm. You are set to have uh, so much money. I mean, your net worth by the time, you know, you get to your 70s is probably going to be between 10 and 20 million if you just stay on a general track that you're on. So that's what the math, yeah, that's what the math says anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. So proud of you guys. Well done. Thanks for calling in and sharing your story. All wealthy people are famous people. They're all athletes in the NFL or the NBA. No, the last two were engineers. By the way, in our study, we looked at the top five most occurring career fields. You know, number one was engineer. Number two, accountant. You know, number three was teacher. The first couple we talked to a minute ago, he was an engineer. She was a teacher. They double whammied it, right? They doubled up on it. And, uh, well, doctors and lawyers, uh, medical doctors didn't make the top five. They were number six. But medical doctors mishandle money like music people. They're some of the dumbest people with money on the planet, statistically. Dumb doctors are everywhere. They really are. I mean, they, they make a lot of money. But the arrogance is just amazing in the way they screw their money up. Some of them do really good, but I I deal with them all the time. So this idea that you have to go get a medical degree to be a millionaire is not true. And by the way, lawyers barely made the cut in the top five. They were number five. A lot of broke lawyers out there. Isn't that interesting? Think, people. Think. Think. Look at the reality that's in front of you, not the bill of goods you're being sold on some stupid reality show that has nothing more to do with reality than anything on the planet. Even the body parts aren't real. This is The Ramsey Show. Stop paying your overpriced wireless provider and switch to Pure Talk. They use the same network as the larger providers for much less. For just $30 a month, get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data with no contract. The average family saves over $70 a month by switching to Pure Talk. Just go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. Pure Talk, simply smarter wireless. Everyday Millionaire Theme Hour, where we are talking to real millionaires, regardless of where their wealth came from, to find out where wealth comes from, not what some broke person's opinion is. The average GPA of a millionaire is not 4.0 and above. You do not have to be a genius. It does help that you're not a doofus. So I don't run into a lot of 2.0s. The average GPA is right around three. Mine was 2.97, and I'm still pissed off about that three one-hundredths of a point. Just missed it. So probably beer involved. I don't know. Could have been. But, um, yeah. So the average millionaire has reasonably good intelli- academic intelligence and prowess, but is not. they're not savants. You do not have to be a genius to become a millionaire. You really don't. You, you mainly have to have discipline. Brian is in Florida. Brian's probably going to prove me wrong. He probably had a 4.7. Brian, how's your net worth? Hey, Dave. It's an honor speaking with you. My net worth is uh, about $1.15 million. Good for you. Give me a little breakdown by category, please. Sure. It's um, So I've got IRAs. 401k and HSAs of uh, about 489,000 um, and some uh, brokerage accounts, 
bank accounts, you know, other savings of about 141,000. Um, and then real estate is a net value of 402,000 over uh, two homes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. How old are you? I am 38 and my wife is 36. All right. A couple of young millionaires again. Very, very good. So how much of this 1.15 million did you inherit? Um, none. So, uh, oh, and I guess I, I have some other, and I it didn't scroll down far enough. I have some 529s and some, some other accounts and all of that that adds up. So, okay. you know, grandparents have put some money into 529s, but, you know, that's not inheritance. It's gotcha. maybe, maybe $10,000. Okay, cool. So what's your best year of household income and your worst year of household income since you guys got started as adults? Sure. Um, best year would be current. And, and since I'm still working, we'll just say it's it's over 200. Mm-hmm. Um and and my wife uh, just this past February decided to stay home with the kids, um, and part of that is just you know my my pay moving up. Prior uh-huh. to 2019, uh-huh. um, you know I, we didn't make over 100,000 as a uh, household, um, and I think my lowest year would have been since we were married was was probably you know around 80,000 combined. Okay, cool. What do you do for a living? <laughs> I'm a commercial lender. Lender, okay. What's your what's your did your wife do before she's a full time mom? Um, she was a marketing director for Chick Fil A. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent, cool. All right. And uh, what are your degrees in? Um, mine are in business through through my MBA, mm-hmm. and uh, hers is in hospitality and event management. Good. Okay. Very good. And what were your GPAs? Um, my undergrad was, you know, kind of low threes and my, my MBA was a 3.8, but I was a little, a little older, a little more mature. Mm-hmm. She was a, uh, I think she was like 3.99. So she's upset about that point oh one. Yeah. But. Got it. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, you guys did this very quickly. Congratulations. You got a great start going here. Um, what is your advice to someone 10, 15 years younger than you? Yeah, I'd say, you know, I'd say to them and, and even the parents of those, you know, kind of maybe high school age kids is um, for me, I started out in banking um, in 2005 at $8 an hour as a teller, mm-hmm. um, you know, but I had tuition reimbursement from the bank and I and I chose my employer for that reason, you know, so I was able to, you know, cobble together enough funding to, you know, not have student loans because of you know, my income, you know, tuition reimbursement, yeah. those sorts of things. And, you know, I, I didn't do it at the fastest pace. It took me about maybe six years to get through my undergrad. Yeah. Um, but I had no loans. So. Yeah. So you're a math nerd like me. Uh, can people still do totally. this? Oh, absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you for calling, man. Elizabeth is in Tampa, Florida. Hey, Elizabeth, what's your net worth? Hi, Dave. Um, it's 1087000 Okay. Good for you. All right, cool. Give me a little breakdown on that by category, like retirement, real estate, so forth. Okay, so in my retirement, I have um, IRA, 401, and a little bit in Roth. That's 872000 um, My emergency fund, I have forty five. dollars um, Equity in my home, about one hundred and forty five. dollars um, cash on hand and checking and savings, fifty five hundred. Uh, new car fund, twelve thousand, and a home repair fund, seventy five hundred. Phenomenal. How old are you? Fifty five. Fifty five. Good for you. Okay. And how much of this money did you inherit? So none of that, but I did inherit forty one thousand after the passing of my mother. But I put that into my kitchen in twenty nineteen, so it's really not included in any of those totals. Okay. All right. So you did inherit 41K, but definitely is not the reason that you're a millionaire. Okay. And oh, what's no. Your... And it immediately went into improving my home. Yeah, so but your value, the value of your home did go up as a result. So it wasn't sure. wasted, but yeah. Okay. True. So what is uh, uh, what was your best year working income and your worst year working income? Okay. My best year was 157000 My worst year was 13000 What were you doing when you made 13000 Oh, that was early on, bank tellering, um, working, you know, wherever I could find a job until I worked my way up. And then um, in my 20s, I got into outside sales in the construction industry, and that's where I've been ever since. Yeah, and you made ding-ding at that. Good for you. Well done. So uh, do you have a four-year degree? 
No, I have a two-year associate's degree. Um, I was working full-time and going to school part-time at night. Um, I graduated when I was 32, and I had a 3.87, which is probably because (laughs) I was paying for it, because in high school, I was no scholar. I was about a 2.0 if I was lucky. Yeah, I hear you. Well, when you're paying for it and it matters, you go get it done. That's good. I like that. So what was your associate? Sure. What's your associates in? Uh, business administration. Good, good. Okay. And that did help you with your sales career, didn't it? Oh, it really did. And it definitely opened the doors. Um, I think it is a little bit difficult to, to get in, to get interviews if you don't have that degree. And it definitely helped me get into my last job that I, where I'm currently working in 2008. I was hired. Um, and I don't know if I would have got the interview if I didn't have some sort of a degree. I don't think it mattered what it was, but it definitely helped that I went to school. Yeah, good for you. So a single lady, 55 years old, with a million eighty-seven thousand dollar net worth, did not inherit enough to cause it to happen. You got up, you left the cave, you killed it, you drug it home. No four-year degree. As a 32-year-old goes and gets an associate's degree, you sound like the American dream is alive and well to me. Oh, you better believe it. It takes a lot of hard work. My dad put a really good work work ethic in us kids, and you know, is work, 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 and um, anybody can do it. And and I didn't even realize, I saw the call out on Instagram, I think it was, where you were doing advertising for the Everyday Millionaires. And I thought, I'm going to, you know, add up my numbers. And I was shocked that I broke the million. Not by much, but I was stunned when I actually found that I actually had hit the one million. You know, what's interesting is you did it. You're impressive. Yeah. You're impressive. I mean, you well, know, I don't care if it's a million eighty seven, I don't care if it's a million eight. I don't care if it's two million eight. You did it and a whole bunch of people sitting around on their couches sucking their thumbs, whining, acting like they're entitled, didn't do nothing. You did it. Well, I spent I spent a lot of time on the road and I listened to a lot of Ramsey all day long while I was driving, you know, three hundred miles a day and um, I finally, I was Davish for several years, and finally, um, after I bought my last brand new car in 2015, I became debt free in 2016. I was done with having debt, and um, so I still have that car, and uh, I've been working at it ever since. And, and I went through some really serious medical challenges in 27 and 2017 and 2018. And if it wasn't for my emergency fund, uh, I was able to actually focus on getting better. That matters a lot. That matters a lot. I'm so proud of you. You're a hero, kiddo. Well done. Very, very well done. It's an honor to speak with you. It's an everyday millionaire's theme hour. We're talking to real millionaires. This is what they sound like. They're not evil people. They're hardworking people. They're people that save. They're generous people. They believe you can do it. Are you hearing them? Scripture of the day, Psalms 84, 11, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk, whose walk is blameless. Thomas Paine said, reputation is what men and women think of us. Character is what God and the angels know of us. If you've been paying attention to this real estate market, you've noticed it's crazy out there. The competition between buyers just to get a house is pretty intense. This is not amateur hour. Inventory is too low. It's too crazy an environment. You need a pro by your side if you're selling to get the most out, if you're buying to make sure you don't put the most in. Our agents and our endorsed local providers program have years of industry success. They do not compromise. They're going to help you do the right thing. And you gotta have some you gotta have some wisdom and some calmness around you when things are this nuts out there instead of somebody's adding to the drama just to get a commission. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash agent, get an endorsed local provider, someone we endorse locally in your area, to provide you with help, in this case, 
in the real estate world. RamseySolutions.com slash agent. It's a millionaire theme hour, an everyday millionaire theme hour. The book Everyday Millionaire is one we publish as the number one bestseller. It is here at Ramsey Solutions. You can learn about the study that was done. You can learn about the conclusions of the study and uh, powerful, powerful information. Uh, if you want actually the white paper on the book, we actually sell that too. So, um, and uh, man, this, this is just an amazing subject. This idea of becoming a millionaire. It's not a billionaire. And truthfully, these days, it's not a lot of money, but it's more than most people have. And it puts you in the category of not broke anymore. It puts you in the category where you are controlling a lot more of your own destiny. You're not going to retire on social insecurity and get the book 73 Ways to Prepare Alpo and love it. You're not going to live on dog food in your retirement years. And these are real stories that really happen. So, you you know, but, but you've got to take the steps. You've got to make the sacrifices. And we, we're talking to real millionaires to find out how they did it. Andy is with us, and Andy is in Seattle, Washington. What is your net worth, Andy? Hi, Dave. Um, my, my husband and I, our net worth is um, 1.98. Excellent. Okay. Break that $2 million down for me by category. Sure. Um, retirement accounts, single stocks, bank stocks, and gold are 830, mm-hmm. mostly retirement and mutual funds. But And then money and checkings and savings for various kind of reasons, kids' college and stuff, is um, 150. Mm-hmm. And then um, our, our house in Seattle, we paid it off, oh, about 10 years ago. It's worth 800 now. Mm-hmm. And we have some land in Pennsylvania. We have two different plots. That's where my husband's from. Um, for a, that, they're worth a hundred each. Mm-hmm. I think that comes up to it. Does it? It does. It does. It's there. Okay. Good. How old are you? Car, I, I thought I could make to make it go over with the car, but I I looked at Kelly Blue Book. Our car is worth eight hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> Won't make it. Oh, I'm straight into the finish no, line. A, so how old are I don't you? Care. I'm fifty. Fifty years old. Good. Yeah. And how much of this $2, $2 million did you guys inherit? Uh, my dad died about 10 years ago, and he left me 15000 15000 So you're not millionaires because of inheritance then? No. <laughs> okay. Not even close. Okay. No. So what is your all's yeah, household income best year since you've been oh. working and worst year since you've been working? Yeah. We got married in 92, and I was looking back. Our our first year, my husband always worked two jobs until he got into tech. Um, so his first, his best year, he worked, let's see, as a florist and a busser at nights. He made 30, and I was a receptionist for 12. Okay. So our best, our lo- first lowest was 42. 42. Okay. Yeah. And then now I make 50, and he makes 100. Okay. So 150. So you've never made yep. over 200. Okay. All right, cool. What are, no. what are your what are your we, careers? We almost, oh, I'm a special education assistant for Seattle Public Schools. I work with kids with autism, mm-hmm. and he is a um, UX research. Got it. All right, Got cool. It, yeah. So, uh, what are your degrees in? I have a bachelor's in psychology, and mm-hmm. he has a bachelor's in psychology, a bachelor's in occupational therapy, a master's in occupational therapy, and a PhD in curriculum instruction. Wow. We, we cash flowed all those degrees while we were living in a studio in wow. Seattle. Excellent. Yeah. So what were your GPAs? Um, I was a 3.5. I think he was a 3.3, like in under his undergrad, first one. Mm-hmm. I don't know what his other ones were. No telling. <laughs> He's got more th- degrees than a thermometer. All right. Very good. Good for you guys. <laughs> okay. So when you set out on this life and he's working bus boy and florist, you're making yep. 42. Did you believe you could do this? No. I, I And I didn't think it was. No. But you know who did? He did, and his parents did, because they were on a dairy farm. They both were born on dairy farms, ran a dairy farm, and were millionaires because they were so good with their money, and they had some rentals, and they always lived beneath their means. And they gave us a book for our wedding from Larry Burkett, and I read it over and over. This was before the Internet, you know? Yeah. yeah that's so a big I just deal. read it over and over, and it can, I, can, I was convinced that we could live below our means. Larry, like, and, Larry's and books changed my life, too. 
Yeah. Yeah. Very amazing. Yeah. Very, very And then cool. we got, we took um, FPU in 94 when it first came out at our church. Wow. You were one of the earlies. Yeah. We were. <laughs> Yeah, we got over on the West Coast pretty quick to Seattle and Spokane and stuff. And that was some of the first financial peace classes that were not in Nashville. Wow. That's oh, amazing. wow, really? Yeah, that, that that's pretty cool. Good for you guys. And so you've been ba- your Baby Steps millionaires, and you've been following the Baby Steps all these years. Well, yeah, we kind of I kind of got actually more back into you when COVID hit because I was working at home, and I was listening to you every day. And I was like, my husband, actually, my husband was going through our finances, and he goes, I think we're on step seven. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, really? <laughs> so that made me want to look into it and maybe call in for one of these. I love so. it. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm so proud of you. Very, very well done. Very well done. Okay, we didn't have anybody call in with a $10 million net worth. All of these were between $1 and $2 million of net worth, every one of them. Uh, high school teacher, engineer, Mom, engineer, marketing, banker, uh, salesperson, UX, special ed teacher. These were the career fields. Uh, None of these people uh, went to MIT, Harvard, or Princeton, or Vanderbilt. None of them, well, at least, I don't know that, because I didn't ask where they went to school, so that's not true. But I can tell by the fact that they didn't have large student loan debts, by and large. So there you go. Uh, Man, oh, man, oh, man. So 52 years old, 38, 38, 55, and 50. I don't want to wait till I'm 80. Well, then don't. I don't want to live my life YOLO. Well, that's being a child. Thank God it's Friday. Oh, God, it's Monday. Yeah, you're a child. That's children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan and follow it. If you live like no one else later, you can live and give like no one else. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. So I I don't care if you want to do this or not, but don't tell lies about what wealth looks like in America. If you don't want to do it, it's okay, but don't tell lies about it and don't tolerate the lies. I was meeting with a, enjoying a great conversation with a young friend of mine who's very, very bright and he's real left winger. And he was talking to me about wealth equality. And I said, well, equality is not fair. He said, what do you mean it's not fair? I said, effort's not fair. Effort's not equal. And if people that give out more effort don't make more than people who sit on their butts, that's not fair. Oh, there's something to think about. Got his little wheels a turning. That puts us our The Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life, let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.